to the European Organic Congress 2020, organized by iFirm Organics Europe and BULB, and with great support by our sponsors. And now, please welcome your host, Joyce Murvius. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, everywhere in Europe. We are very happy to welcome you to the European Organic Congress 2020 Organic in Action. This special digital edition of the event is brought to you by iFORM Organics Europe and the German Association of Organic Farmers, Food Processors and Retailers, BÖLV. As your host for the next three days, I'm very happy to facilitate your experience here, help you to navigate, learn and interact with us. Because even if we can't be together in one room, we can still get in touch with each other. Let me very briefly show you how. Just look down on your screen. There you see our two emoji buttons. You can give thumbs up or clap if you like what our speaker said. Maybe you try it now. Just push and all the emo emo emotions will fly in from all over the world. If you want to chat with us, please use our chat function. Look down on your screen on the right side. You can type in whatever you want to type in and comment. And if you want to ask a question, of course you do that. Left on the screen, you see a small envelope. Type in your question there throughout the whole Congress. And moreover, make sure you do it in English because that's our Congress language. And now I switch to German really quick. Sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, wenn Sie das lieber alles auf Deutsch hören möchten, dann gehen Sie unten auf das kleine Rädchen der Einstellungen und switchen einfach zu Deutsch. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this was German. And now, any questions left? Make sure you visit our conference website, organic-congress-iformeu.org. Before we officially kick off the Congress now, let us run through the agenda of the session really quick. Our first session will guide you into the EOC's topic, Organic in Action. So get inspired. First of all, we are very happy to have a welcome speech of Jan Plage, president of iForm Organic Europe. Right after Jan, Julia Klöckner, federal minister of Germany, agriculture and food, joins in with a video statement. After her, Felix Prince Sullivanstein joins the stage and welcomes everybody wherever you join us. More inspiration after Felix with our Petra Kucha session, starting in Finland far north with Anu Aro Lakso, product manager of Savo Consortium for Education. Then we drive down to France and welcome Francois Jigou, who will present the topic Herb Egg Biocanteens from the Organic Canteen to the Territorial Food Project all over Europe. All right, now you already know where our speakers join in from. Now you want, we want to know where you are located. Let's do a small interaction, a poll resulting in a world cloud. When I ask you the following question, you have 10 seconds to answer and make sure you answer in just one word. The question is, which city are you from? 10 seconds start from now. from literally everywhere. I see many people from Brussels and Berlin, but also from Sweden. I saw Peru and everything. So I think now it's totally, totally time to kick off our Congress. Please welcome on stage the president of iForm Organics Europe, Jan Plage. Good morning, Jan. So good to see you. Good morning, I, Joyce. Hi. <laughs> Did you see the world cloud? People are joining in from all over Europe and the world. Are you excited? 
Yeah, it's really exciting um, that so, ma so ma many people are joining. In our announcement of this Congress, uh, we, we wrote that uh, 250 stakeholders and experts <laughs> would join. And now it's five times more than we okay. planned for this event. Um, so this clearly shows organics are in action. Totally, it's in action. So you're kicking off the Congress now officially. Jan, stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And on behalf of iForm Organics Europe, I really warmly welcome all of you. A warm welcome to our members, to the farmers, to breeders, processors, traders, retailers, to scientists, advisors, certifiers, members of parliament and their teams, to colleagues from the EU Commission services, to local authorities and to everybody all over Europe and all over the world, a warm welcome to our European Organic Congress 2020. Our Congress sends a clear signal. We are ready to contribute to achieve the European goals in this heavy crisis. We face a climate catastrophe, which we observe is coming much quicker than even scientists believed. The loss of biodiversity every day of many farm families all over the world with less income for the efforts to establish sustainable farm systems. The crisis of our economy, where we see that our current system is not prepared to be resilient, and the crisis of our health system with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Organics, I form Organics Europe, is ready for action, and this Congress is about the question how and what are the right actions to achieve our goals to overcome this crisis and this to to um, to solve and to act in these systemic challenges which actions are appropriate to transform farm systems value chains the political frameworks to remunerate farmers for public goods how can we convince farmers to convert to organic and to be an active part of our movement? And how can they further develop our own systems respecting our organic principles? And this is one of the most discussed questions in these days. And we have to answer this maybe during this Congress. How can we convert consumer habits to a more sustainable consumption? How do we convert non-agricultural families and households together with the farmers who are very open for the changes if they have a secure partner in the markets. All this needs the answers to develop the right actions making Europe more organic and achieving the targets from the new Green Deal and the encouraging and motivating farm to fork strategy of the EU Commission. I'm convinced that our movement in Europe provides and develops good and fitting answers and approaches to get power and impact in the new organic action plan of our European Union. Why I'm so convinced? So many of you participated in former European organic congresses. And remember five years ago, it was in 2015 in Riga, in Latvia, when our movement decided and published our vision 2030, making Europe more organic, organic on every table, establishing organics as leading solution for transformation food and farm systems. In summary, we clearly decided five years ago and communicated that organic is not a niche concept and that our principles are not luxury for some wealthy groups in our society. And that organic movement of farmers, processors, retailers, scientists, advisors, etc wants to mainstream organic principles in all farm and food systems and looks for a transformation of these systems. From that year on, we didn't rest for further development, this message and to engage all over Europe, farmers and um, consumers and citizens in conversion and transformation of value chains. And to be very clear, we didn't stand still for further development of our systems to more sustainability. The organic movement was not established to defend a status quo. Our movement is dedicated to improve, to inspire, and to deliver. 
So research and development gets an increasing part of our movement, although the engagement of governments, of many governments, not all, and institutions is still far too low compared to the needed resources in improving our organic systems, our education, and our advisory services. From that background, the organic movement, many stakeholders, and the EU institution manifested the vision and the goal that organics are in the heart of the current transformation process of food and farm systems in the EU and worldwide. Here we are now to discuss how we can reach this vision, these goals, where we need new actions and how we develop a powerful plan to reach at least 25% organics in the European Union by 2030. Organics are connected, organics are in action, enjoy your contribution and welcome to our European Organic Congress 2020. Thank you very much. Hello again, Jan. Thank you for that very warm and contentful welcome to our guests from all over the world. Um, next, I think I'm pretty sure you have met our next guest several times yet, right? And talked to her, isn't it? Yes, I know her. It's um, our Federal Minister of Agriculture, Julia Knöckler. It's a bit sad that she couldn't be uh, live here, but it's the 1st of July and there's probably a lot to do in her ministry now with the start of the European, of the presidency uh, of our European Union. So she has a lot of um, tasks and respons responsibilities, but I'm glad that she sent the video messages to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Organic Congress is an important conference. I am delighted that you are addressing such an important topic digitally in the extraordinary times. Today Germany is assuming the EU Council Presidency for the first time in 13 years, six months during which we can set political priorities together with our European partners a great opportunity that comes with great responsibility. The coronavirus pandemic will be a major topic. It will likely influence the discussions on the post-2020 common agricultural policy. Food security, resource conservation and climate change adaptation are enormous challenges facing the agricultural sector. For the future of the common agricultural policy, this means that it should contribute to improving environmental and climate impacts and to making direct payments more target-oriented. At the same time, the member states should be granted more flexibility. The multi-annual financial framework plays a significant role in this. After all, one thing is for certain. Additional environmental and climate services do not come free for charge. This is closely tied to the European Commission's Farm to Fork strategy. This strategy concerns additional requirements imposed on the agricultural sector. This strategy aims to make food systems sustainable by decreasing uh, detrimental effects on the environment. At the same time, Food security must be guaranteed while also keeping food prices at affordable levels. We will be scrutinizing this strategy in detail during our presidency of the Council. The strategy presents organic farming with a huge opportunity. By 2030, the aim is for the area devoted to organic farming within the European Union to have grown to 25%. We are also focusing on a target in Germany, 20% organic farming by 2030. We have various funding instruments to further boost organic farming. To name just a few, area-based payments in the rural development measures from the second pillar of the common agricultural policy, direct payments from the first pillar of the gap, basic payments, redistributive payments, screening payments, exemptions from the green requirements, funding for research and development and activities via the federal scheme of organic farming and other forms of sustainable agriculture. Current figures show that these steps have been successful in Germany. Last year, 
The area devoted to organic farming increased by almost 8% compared with 2018 uh, to roughly 1.6 million hectares. The number of organic farms has also increased by almost 8%. Currently, 9.7% of all agricultural land is used for organic farming. These are all great successes, but we must not let up now, nor do we wish to. The proportion of organic farming is increasing in Europe as well. In 2018, the area devoted to organic farming increased by 1.25 million hectares in Europe and by 1 million hectares in the European Union compared with 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, even though we have a long way to go, we are on course towards achieving our 20% target. On the European level too, we are pursuing the further expansion of organic farming. The action plan announced by the European Commission can give important impetus. We will further promote and advance this topic during the German Council Presidency. And now I would like to wish you every success for this conference. Thank you very much. Stay healthy, take care and see you soon. Hey, and so first impressions on Mr. Kleckner's speech. Yeah, it's quite en encouraging for all of us, isn't it? Um, uh, she clearly said um, Germany uh, wants to contribute um, to, to, to the European strategies. Uh, Germany has already a clear target of at, at least 20 percent of uh, organic man managed land, has a clear action plan. So uh, this is a good framework and a good starting point for the questions and for the task we want to discuss during this Congress. For sure, you're right. And I want to thank you again for your introduction. And I think we see you soon because you join in tomorrow for CAP session and 10 a.m. sharp. So if you want to join in with our president of IFRM Organics Europe again, make sure you join in CAP session. So goodbye, Jan. And now it's thank time you. to say... <laughs> hey there. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time to say hello to our next speaker to the and welcome him to the main Congress stage. Please welcome the chairman of BLV, Felix Prinz zu Löwenstein. Good morning, Felix. Very good Hello, to see Lord. you. Hey there. Where are you dialing in from, from your farm? I'm here on our farm in the south of Germany, close to Frankfurt. Everybody else is working outside on the field, and I'm, I have the privilege to be inside the office and follow the EOC. Yeah, and we are really happy to have you here. And I just say, Felix, stage is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the organic movement in Europe, may I also welcome you very warmly. It is a strange idea that more than a thousand people are gathered here virtually, but some are sitting on an alpine pasture in the mountains, others are watching the sea behind the screen, yet others are in the offices of some city on our continent and we have a cup of coffee because nobody can watch them. Yeah. I'm great such and creative people in our offices who have prepared this event so perfectly. But at the same time, I'm a little sad that we cannot have you as our guests in, as we say in German, flesh and blood, that we cannot celebrate with you in the evening, that we cannot show you what the organic sector in Germany has to offer in the way of exciting farms, food processors and trading companies. We would have loved to let you experience how organic in action looks like in our, in our country. We have just heard from Jan Plage and also from our minister about the manifold problems facing agriculture and food production in Europe. They have demonstrated the opportunities and challenges in European policy to develop organic farming in such a way that it can make a tangible contribution to solving these problems. As ambitious as the quantitative objectives that are linked to this are, I am confident that they can 
be achieved. When we realize on our farm here that we were not yet doing enough to build up humus in our soils, we looked around for the pioneers who were already much further ahead than we were. And then we tried to learn from them and adapt their methods to our, to, to, um, to our conditions. We can do the same with the expansion of organic farming in the countries of Europe. Because we already have examples of good practice that we can use as a guide. There's one lesson to be learned from these examples right at the start. If it is only the agricultural ministries that are concerned with achieving these goals, it will not succeed. What we need is the commitment of the whole government, on the, of the whole of Germany and all European countries. My impression is that there's still a great deal to be done there. However, even if we succeed in having 25% organic farming in, by 2030, in view of the dramatic loss of biodiversity, the climate crisis that is already beginning, the decline in soil fertility, water pollution, can we afford to say it is nice to see the right thing happening now on a quarter of the land? Certainly not. We must succeed in simultaneously changing the whole of agriculture so that it stops destroying its own production preconditions. It is important that we discuss also during the three days of our Congress what role organic farming can and must play in this transformation process. I myself have never seen our project as one in which a lucrative niche for its actors can be comfortably padded out. I see us as hosts of change, as those who trample out the path that can be, become the road for all. However, we can only achieve this if politicians recognize the opportunity that organic farming represents for the implementation of their goals. And if we ourselves work continuously and successfully to become better, so that we become the truly sustainable alternative on which our children and the generations after them are so urgently dependent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix, for that excellent kickoff. I just want to say really quick sorry for the digital challenges we are facing. Sometimes if the internet connection is not so well, so that you missed the first two or three sentences, but I'm pretty sure um, topics will be discussed afterwards anyways. So Felix, um, thanks again. Uh, there were a lot of claps and thumbs up rolling onto you. And I wonder what you are most looking forward in the EOC now. Yeah, I'm particularly looking forward to our contribution to the response that must now be given to the crisis. What consequences do we draw from the realization that a global economy trimmed for maximum productivity and lowest costs proved to be insufficiently unsuff resilient when a crisis occurs? A very small crisis compared to the ones we have yet to face. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, there are many people looking forward to that topic. And for now, I just say thank you very much, Felix, um, and see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Felix Prinz zu Löwenstein. Bye bye. So, ladies and gentlemen, next we will dive in into our Pecha Kucha session. Pecha Kucha is Japanese and means chit chat. With that format, our experts tell you a short story showing 20 slides, which they each commenting for 20 seconds on. That adds up to short but sweet 6 minute 40 inspiration for you. And don't forget, throughout the whole time, you have the possibility to comment in our chat or send in questions. And now let's start with our first Pecha Kucha. It is titled Step by Step Towards Organic in Finnish Food Service 
Please welcome to our Congress the project manager from Savo Consortium of Education from Finland, Anu Arolakso. Hello, Anu. Good morning. Very glad to see you. Good morning. It's very <laughs> nice to be here. Yeah. You're joining in from far north. How is the weather with you today? Actually, last night we have quite a big uh, summer storm and oh. luckily we, we have some electric cuts and, but now it's over and the weather is fine. Yeah. But everything else is, uh, is good. Great. So your inter internet connection looks stable. That's why I just say uh -huh. we are happy to enjoy your picture culture now. Anu, stage yeah. is yours. So I was uh, asked to tell you a little bit about gastronomy and uh, the supply chain. So here we go. This is my hometown Kuopio in Eastern Finland. I work with a team of expertise in Sava Consortium for Education. My main job is to help professional kitchens to use more organic. And this is how we want our food look like, beautiful and tasty. Still simple so we can recognize what we are eating and be able to tell where the food comes from. In Finland, we have uh, still four beautiful and great seasons. To keep our climate even close, this way we have to change the way of working and thinking in every level. In professional kitchens, uh, they should start to think sustainability so that it reaches all the way from the farm to the plate. Food consumption and production have significant effects on the environment. Professional kitchens play a major role in reducing environmental impact because they use huge amount of foodstuffs. The biggest environmental impact of kitchens comes from the production of foodstuffs, so it's important to understand the differences of climate impact between production methods. The holy trinity in gastronomy is great taste, high quality and sustainability. This is where we come to sustainable gastronomy. The climate impact of food consumption can be reduced by favoring responsibly produced food, for example, from organic farming. To get those great and sustainable foodstuffs to customers' plates, uh, the whole food chain must work together seamlessly. It's not enough to increase the area of uh, organic production if processing of food is not increased and developed as well. If any kind of food services wants to act sustainably, they have to have a right attitude and urge to do so. The sustainable gastronomy needs happy and passionate professionals who give the face to it. These professionals work in food services where using organic is everyday business and they are very proud of it. When everything works out right, those professionals conjure up culinary experiences. The customer can taste and see sustainability and feels that he or she is able to make an impact through it. This is the green deal at its best. Uh, the food services has customers from little children to elderly people and everything between who have different kind of needs for food. It doesn't prevent the food services from operating sustainably and using organic. Sustainable, orga uh, sustainable gastronomy isn't tied up to a place or time. It can provide experiences also otherwise than only on the plate. We have to teach children where food comes from and maintain the connection to the nature. These are the happy customers of a service uh, center Helsinki enjoying an organic picnic lunch. I think uh, that the most important customers are elderly people who has a long culinary taste memory. The food services should respect this and serve them food they know and recognize. The young customers are the best drivers for food services on the way to sustainability. Young people are worried about the climate change. Uh, they want to know how their food is pro produced and they prefer the restaurants and cafes which use organic. 
Sustainable gastronomy starts with educating our future professionals. Teaching and working in vocational schools are in transition and we have a great opportunity to make these future professional drivers who can change the whole food service business. It's important to pass traditions to our children uh, so they know and remember their own culinary roots. Sustainable gastronomy can provide new perspectives to traditions, but mustn't change it too much. In Finland, the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry has decided to grant higher share to organic via school distribution support. If public food services offer milk, uh, organic milk instead of conventional, they receive twice the amount of subsidy. This has increased the use of organic milk. I am responsible for our step-by-step -step to organic program uh, that will help kitchens to increase use of organic and tell reliably about it. At the moment, there are over 2,400 uh, kitchens in the program. Most of them are public and on step two. All these kitchens have a huge demand for organic products in all product uh, groups. In Finland, we are heading to organic step by step. To make this a step bigger or even faster, we need clear and ambitious targets from our government how much organic is to be used in food services, enough resources to make conversion in kitchens, and organic products that kitchens can afford to buy. Furthermore, we need more information and understanding on the impact of organic production in combating climate uh, change. If it's possible to grow grapes here in Finland, it's possible to use more organic also. These grapes are growing in greenhouse, but if we don't make changes to our consumption, it's only a matter of time when they grow without it. Uh, the interest of agricultural tourism is growing and we have beautiful, peaceful and clean country that it's worth to visit. At least I am heading on summer vacation after this presentation and I'm going to enjoy my campfire coffee and uh, the midnight sun with a few mosquitoes. I thank you all for your interest and I wish you all very nice and warm summer. Thank you. Hello again, Anu. Thanks for your Hello. Kutsche. <laughs> that was really indeed inspiring and interesting what you do there in Finland. And we have a huge audience, as you know, and they are all watching and giving you thumbs up and clap now, as you can see, maybe. And <laughs> they maybe also have questions for you. So let's, we do, we do. So let's have, let, let's have a look at the questions. So the first question is to you, Anu. What will need to be done yet after 1st January 2021? What will be the main issues to be discussed from that date? I think that the major um, issue is that the, how do we get uh, more organic uh, products uh, to, uh, to the kitchen to use? Uh, because uh, here in Finland, uh, the public, uh, especially the public kitchens, they want to use um, organic that it's produced here in Finland. So the, the production must um, get more and more uh, products to the kitchens. Okay, thank you, Anu. And I wonder, you, you, you talked about the challenges you face. Um, from your perspective, to change or transform the food service towards organic, what is kind of the biggest bottleneck you're facing? Um, I think that uh, we don't have, uh, as I said, we need uh, to clear and ambitious targets uh, where to head, uh, where the kitchen uh, are heading. And um, I think the, the bottleneck, uh, the biggest one is that the, there are not, not enough products uh, that the kitchen can use. And uh, the organic is still a little bit too expensive for the kitchens. Okay. Thank you, Anu. I'm sure we have a lot more questions, but Time's over, unfortunately. So thank you very much for joining us with that excellent presentation.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, of course, we can't answer all your questions, but I just want to tell you, we will have a Congress documentation on our website, like in the next week. You can see all presentations and videos and rewatch it. So make sure you still send in your questions and be sure I from Organics Europe and BLV take them also into account for our future work. So I hope you had a good experience, Anu. Wish yes, you a nice Alice, summer. Thank you. Um, yes, and good midnight too. sun coffee. <laughs> and thank, thank you very much. See you much. next time. Ne From Finland, yeah, Anu Arulaksu. So, ladies and gentlemen, and now you expect Jörn Sanders from German Tunen Institute with his pitch. Unfortunately, this is postponed to tomorrow. And because of that, with the next pitch, we travel southwest, I guess, yes, to a country which is well known for its excellent food and wine, La France. So let's get inspired by a French expert and discover how organic food is brought into school in France. Please welcome to our Congress the lead expert from BioCantine Network, François Jégou. Yay, François. Dear François, we are happy to have you here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, fine. That's much better. Thank ah, you. okay. Yeah, no problem. I am really curious now. How was the last organic meal that you ate in a school? Uh, uh, I'm pretty old now for remembering uh, the schools, but uh, uh, despite I was in France, and uh, that normally it's a, a country well known for good food, uh, my canteen was not a very good uh, canteen. But my, but my last meal in the school, despite my age, is uh, <laughs> some uh, months ago. Uh, and it was in um, uh, one of the cities uh, that I will talk about. Um, and um, they are a very, very interesting uh, canteen. Um, and uh, this was a really delightful meal. I'm happy and... Oh. Okay, I think now we to hear more about this François, stage is yours. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be invited here. Um, I will uh, show you some things about um, uh, this uh, uh, biocantine networks. You're certainly all familiar with uh, Asterix, and you know, uh, if you open one of his albums, that uh, uh, this uh, small Gallic village uh, was resisting to the Roman Empire. And in France, um, there is um, also a small sustainable city that resists to the unsustainable French Riviera. It's called Montsartou. It's not a village. It's a 10,000 inhabitant city in the center of a triple agglomeration between Cannes, Agras, and Antibes. And they are fighting against French Riviera, against real estate interest, high pressure on land, and uh, mass tourism. In a nutshell, uh, Montsartou is uh, much more than that, but it's uh, uh, in particular three primary schools canteen in the city, uh, about thousands lunches per day, 100% organic and local. So probably you, you wonder, well, what is the secret? Do they, do they have a treasure? Um, first of all, it's uh, very much about food waste fighting. So, um, so much that uh, the local and organic meal is at a bit more than uh, two euro, which is the same as the industrial catering average in France. Second element, um, vegetables are mostly produced by a complete municipal food chain. The two guys that you see on the slide here are uh, farmers. They are civil servant farmers belonging to a municipal farm from Monsartu. Here I think that number speaks from themselves in terms of uh, urban planning and agricultural land use. 
six hectares at 700 from the city center. Remember, if some of you have visited the French Riviera, that's pretty exceptional, producing 25 tons of organic certified vegetables. Of course, the canteen of a school is a school for food education. And here on the image, you see kids, teams of kids that after each meal are measuring food waste for every single uh, different dishes of, of, of lunch. And they after go for a time discussing with a cook on how to improve it. Last but not least, you know that cities don't have official competence in food. Monsanto has set its own center for sustainable food and education. Remember the size of a city. In a way, for me, it's a sort of their food department of a municipality or a sort of unofficial food department. I would like to leave the floor for one slide to Cathy, one of the chefs of the three primary schools. Um, she, they worked very hard uh, with uh, all dishes and with the kids to adjust the recipe. And the child gratin is now uh, liked after three, four times, changing the recipe, discussing with the kids and measuring waste that they all uh, like it. Another way to summarize this practice, it's uh, a scheme. Um, here it's maybe an unusual scheme to leave you a lasting impression. Um, we call it the Monsanto two five leaf clover. So, you know, f four leaves clover is already uh, nice. Five leaves is better, but it shows um, that this uh, canteen scheme is at the earth of uh, a systemic transformation of a territory. This uh, uh, made Monsanto has been selected uh, within uh, 27 European cities as Urbact Network Good Practice for their sustainable and integrated governance. This means that uh, six of the European cities have applied to take uh, inspiration. Um, and um, they want to implement Monsanto practice. All together, they constitute uh, the bio canteen networks, uh, one of the 23 urban transfer networks that Urbact is experimenting uh, on, on how to transfer a good practice. I would like now to finish with giving you a short tour to the other cities, but because they are transferring the practice, but they are also have interesting practices. Um, in uh, Trojan, in Bulgaria, this is um, the first grown apple, the first apple from Trojan municipal farm. So they started at the beginning of a project two years ago, and they now have a municipal farm implemented. Uh, Paid Condrus in Belgium is not a city, it's a local action group of seven villages two strong social uh, incubators, one for kitchen staff that provide kitchen services, and one for organic farmers, uh, training program and support for starting activity. Romania, Vaslui, the city of Vaslui, uh, the municipality is not in charge of small canteen. They have also been awarded as a urban good practice for their social centers, and they are working um, with daycare centers uh, canteen and trying to make them align with Monsanto's uh, canteen. Uh, Torres Vedras in Portugal has recognized uh, also as a good practice in Portugal for their sustainable and healthy food canteen program. Um, and they are also about to set a municipal farm. Tricala in Greece, they also don't have canteen, but uh, food kiosk selling snacks in schools. No canteen culture, so they are struggling to help families and kids to change for healthy and organic food habits. Uh, last but not least, uh, Rossinia Maritimo in Italy, uh, they don't have a farm and they won't build one. They are working with large catering company, but they are still at 60% organic food, not local, of course. And they are going to increase, uh, um, and, and, and work, working on, on, on public procurement. Uh, to conclude, um, 
I think that uh, as a lead expert of Eurobact, I was a bit cautious about this uh, notion of good practices and transfer process. And now after two years uh, working, we co-designed with the seven cities an entire transfer toolbox, chopping the good practice of Monsanto in eight transfer modules, developing uh, kitchen and food education, micro good practice guides, uh, posters on land use, on food sovereignty. So it's a form of invitation. We are ready to share this practice, not only with the six partner cities, but with all other European city and beyond. We are waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois, for that interesting insight into bio canteens. I don't know whether you recognize the chat um, speaking, but you can be sure you be contacted, I guess, because a lot of people already asked for contact um, because it's just super interesting. So um, I wonder, um, before we have a look at the questions from the audience that are rolling in, um, from your opinion, what could politics do to have an organic meal for every kid? How could they support initiatives like yours? I think that uh, the canteen schemes is something which is quite um, easy to push. Uh, whatever party is at the government, um, nobody is against health uh, for kids. So it's a it's an easy uh, entry uh, 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 point. I think easy. I'm sorry, I, I'm not saying that it's easy, but but it's a quite open entry point, and um, which is resisting political alternance uh, um, from a long run. Um, and um, I think it's a also very uh, interesting point for politics to. Uh, start transition on their territory. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as we were saying in these uh, four, uh, five uh, leaves clover schemes, uh, canteens as a, uh, are a way to tackle uh, uh, transformation of uh, behaviors of families, so their, their way of purchasing, uh, the, the transformation of the, the, the increase of, of jobs and uh, land use, um, um, uh, governance. So it's, it's a really systemic approach, despite it seems to be only a canteen. And I think it's a, it's a good uh, uh, point to invest um, uh, in political campaign, if I may say. Yeah, thank you for, for your opinion on that. And now I hear that we have a question rolling in from the audience. Can you show that, please? How can we reach the future consumer buyers? The young kids will bring the message home, to my opinion. I think it's not a question, it's an answer <laughs> in a certain way. Yes, of course. Of course, that's one of the tricks uh, of this, uh, of this uh, um, investment in, in canteen. Um, I think that uh, schools are, and, and, and young um, uh, uh, pupil schools, are really uh, transformation hubs for, for cities. I'm thinking of a canteen, of course, um, of practices that, you know, um, in many places we have lost or we never had uh, a food, uh, a rich food culture. Um, one of the practice that uh, these uh, cities are implementing is that they share the recipes from the schools. Uh, it seems to be terrible from one side. This means that parents don't know how to cook. On the other side, if you see it positively, uh, I think it's very interesting because the work that has been done between cooks and kids to adapt the recipe um, is then re-exported uh, to the families that, uh, that cook the same dishes that your daughter or your son uh, like so much in the school. This is part of these micro good practices on food education and, and, and kitchens that we have collected from the different cities. And I think that that's a, a good example. Of course, uh, schools are also a very um, open place 
uh, generally uh, in cities that are lacking places for, for example, uh, delivery of, uh, of organic baskets, contact with uh, local agriculture, uh, micro uh, farmer market, organizing the schools, and then you've got these as the question was mentioning, this uh, um, engagement process that if my mom is receiving a basket uh, or if my, the mom of my friend is receiving a basket, why not us, uh, our family? Uh, why uh, are not uh, aren't you, we uh, also buying to the agriculture uh, that is, by the way, also teaching some lessons in our school? So that's a really, really uh, a, a good track to to, uh, to to try. All right, thank you. That's so interesting, and I'm I'm a bit sad that time's up now, Francois. But thank you very much for your picture kucha and that bunch of information. I'm pretty sure a lot of people will talk to you in, in future, and I hope you you get in touch. So, ladies and gentlemen, Francois Jegu. Thank you very much for inviting us. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining our very first session of the European Organic Congress 2020 Organic in Action from iFarm Organics Europe and BEULV. Thanks to all our fantastic speakers. I hope and we hope you got inspired and you are warmed up now for the next two and a half days of our digital event. Now we have a break and we see you all back at our virtual stage at 11.30 sharp. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for being part of the European Organic Congress 2020, organized by iFirm Organics Europe and BULV, and with great support by our sponsors. It's time for a break. Thank you and see you soon. European Organic Congress 2020, organized by iFirm Organics Europe and BULB, and with great support by our sponsors. And now, please welcome your host, Joyce Murvius. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and welcome back to the European Organic Congress, Organic in Action. With this special digital edition of EOC 2020 is organized by iFarm Organics Europe and the German Association of Organic Farmers, Food Processors and Retailers. And you know, although we can't be together in one room today, we can still interact. And I want to show you how really quick. Look down on your screen and right in the middle, you see you can use our emoji buttons. So give a thumbs up or applause for our experts today. If you want to comment on something, please use our chat. You find it on the right side of your screen. And if you want to ask a question, we please you to ask it through our question tool. You find it on the left side of the screen. And of course, you can ask questions throughout the whole Congress. And make sure you do it in English because that's our conference language. Und meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, 
Wenn Sie nicht so richtig lieber Englisch hören wollen, sondern eher Deutsch, dann können Sie auch die Sprache wechseln. Gehen Sie dazu unten einmal auf den Einstellungsbutton, das ist dieses kleine Rädchen, und verstellen die Sprache dort Richtung Deutsch. Okay, that was German. Any questions left? Make sure you visit our conference website. Organic minus Congress minus iformeu.org. Before we kick off our regulation session now, let's have a brief view on the agenda. Titled, The New Organic Regulation. Are you ready for it? Let's start with two experts. Nicolas Verlet from the European Commission and next Marian Blom, Vice President of iform Organics Europe. Both of them join in a little talk afterward with the title, New Organic Regulation. Are you ready for it? Next, Georg Eckert, President of European Organic Certifier Council, joins in and the topic will be control then. Then we switch topics again. With Michael Renault, Vice President of Ecosert, joins the stage. We talk about inputs. Imports, sorry. Last but not least, we wrap up that session for you, that you have an overview and we have an outlook to the second day of the EOC. For the moderation of this panel, we can't have a better person. So welcome on stage, ladies and gentlemen, the regulation manager of iFORM Organics Europe, Emanuele Busaka. Hey there, Emanuele, nice to see you. Good morning. Hello, Joyce, nice to see you as well. <laughs> How are you doing today? Everything is very good in Brussels, but the weather. Uh, it's 1st of July and it's raining, uh, but that's Brussels and I also <laughs> like Belgium for this. For the rest, everything is well. What about you? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm in Düsseldorf in the studio and it's raining as well, but we are indoors, so it doesn't matter, right? So, yeah. I wonder about regulation. How long have you been working on that topic already? Yes, I started working in organic certification in 2008 in Italy and later, and later on I joined the Brussels office uh, of uh, iFarm Organics Europe in 2012, where since the beginning I have worked on both the current regulation, also the future regulation. So in reality it's 12 years, it's not a lot, but I managed to uh, work on the three EU regulations, from the one of 1991 to the future one of 2021 or perhaps 2022. So, ladies and gentlemen, you see, you can't have a better moderator for a regulation session. So, Emanuele, stage is yours. Hi again to everyone and welcome on the most exciting session of the Congress. I'm very lucky because in the first part of the session, uh, two distinguished speakers will join us. Uh, Nicolas Verlet is the head of the organic unit in the EU Commission and Marianne Blom is our vice president of iFarm Organics Europe, but also she comes from the Dutch Organic Federation Bionex or BNX. Therefore, please all together welcome to our Congress, Nicolas Verlet and Marianne Blom. Hello, Nicola, and hello, Marian, and thanks for joining us and joining the European Organic Congress. Uh, Nicola, just to check our connection, from which city will you talk to us? Uh, Emanuel, I would love to be in Berlin we, with all of us, I must say, but unfortunately, I am in Brussels. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, Mike is working and also audio. And uh, Marian, instead, where are you speaking from? Um, uh, yes. Um, where do you speak from? Okay. Uh, thank you, Emanuele. I'm speaking from Utrecht and um, from working from home office home office and when i look out of my window i see my my back garden um, 
Okay, good, good. So you are in a good setting and we are not so far uh, one from the other because Belgium and Netherlands are, are very close. So, okay, everything seems ready. So we can start with the first statement from uh, Nicola. Uh, Nicola will present the state of play of the legal process uh, for the new organic regulation. Uh, Marian, we will be back in five minutes and Nicola, stage is yours immediately after the animation. Many thanks, Emmanuel. So I just have a few minutes to to give you some, some information on where we are in the secondary legislation. So maybe the most important is to mention that now a first draft of all the implementing and delegated act on production, control and trade has been submitted to the relevant committee, which is, you know, the COP for, for the implementing act and what we call the GREGS for the delegated act in, involving also representative of the parliaments. And so all of them are at different stage, but they are all in intensive revision process uh, to take into account uh, all the detailed comments we receive and in particular IFOAM, of course, and the OFCC, but also other stakeholders, member states and the parliament. And this is very important because the secondary legislation, as you know very well, covers very detailed rules for production, but marketing, control, imports, and all of these very specific detailed rules are decisive for the future development of the organic sector. And for us, from the very beginning, this means that this text cannot be designed uh, and imposed from Brussels. So that's why the intensive consultation, uh, both formal and informal, is needed with all parties involved. And I must say that this approach uh, has been successful because we have been able to uh, approve and adopt the important package for the production rule, the implementing act on production rules, uh, with the quasi unanimity of member states, we get only two, two abstention, but it was really at the end a unanimous, quasi unanimous approval by member states. But of course, this is a very lengthy process. Uh, and where we are now. So briefly on production rules, we still have five delegated acts to be adopted. Uh, just to, to, to inform you, you have the exceptional rules. It's the derogation in case of catastrophic circumstances. An important one is the labeling for feed and fodder seeds. And indeed the, the, the delegated act on production and marketing of heterogeneous plant material, which is a very important part. And also some uh, uh, important implementing act on the revision of all technical annex dealing uh, with uh, fertilizer, uh, additives, uh, plant protection product. And for most of them, the feedback mechanism, that means the, the way where, where the public could uh, give some comments will be uh, launched in the following weeks, uh, some, some of them during summer, some of them in September. Regarding control, uh, the full package, which is one implementing act and two delegated acts, has just been submitted for the what we call the inter-service consultation within the Commission. And following this inter-service consultation, again, the feedback mechanism, that means the public consultation, uh, will be launched probably mid or end of July. So it's important that you know this day so you can, uh, you have four weeks to send any kind of comments you would like to, to, to you to send on this uh, text. And uh, the control package we will discuss later on uh, contains important subjects such as the investigation to be done undertaken in case of suspicion of, of uh, presence of non-authorized uh, substance, but also the template for the catalog of measure, exchange of information, traceability and mass balance check, and last but not least, the rule for group of operators. On trade, which is uh, also a very important package, we will have one implementing act and one delegated act adopted for the transitional rules for the control body recognized under equivalency. You know that the, the equivalency uh, will uh, be able to continue until 2023. So we have to set up some rules for this transitional period. We need also, of course, to set up uh, the, the compliance scheme with a full set of provision on the certificate of inspection, 
the criteria for the recognition of, of the CB supervision by the, the commission. And for all these detailed rules on control for imports, uh, the, we hope that the inter-service consultation and the feedback mechanism is, will be launched in, in September and October. So, Emanuele, with these few minutes, I suggest that I stop here, but of course I will be available for any, any questions later on. Nicola, for your update, it's interesting to know that the feedback mechanism is in the uh, middle of summer when I'm supposed to be on holidays and back to Italy after three months of lockdown in Belgium. <laughs> but OK, we can work from home and that's good. Uh, so now it's Marian's turn. Uh, Marian will tell us uh, more about the expected changes and challenges for organic operators, so farmers, processors, and traders. So, Nicola, we will, back, we will be back in five minutes, and Marian, stage is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Emanuele. And um, it's almost non-doable to uh, really have an overview of all the changes, but maybe before I start, it's really important to say that uh, the core of the current regulation actually has been transposed into the new regulation, which means that the, the basis of many production rules stay the same. Having said that, there will, of course, be changes for uh, many farmers and entrepreneurs that are active in the organic sector. If I start from the basis, from the soil, um, in the new regulation, the principle of soil-related crop production has been strengthened. And this is a good thing because it gives clarity to the um, to the, the operators that are working now in organic um, and that sometimes have fierce discussions with other, other sustainable production systems. But it also means that some now organic producers in Finland, Sweden and Denmark will have to change their operations that are based on above ground production systems to um, soil related production systems. And the new regulation also gives clarity on what products can be sold in a pot to the consumer. It is limited to herbs um, and ornamentals. From the soil to the plant. The, for plants, you need organic seeds and organic vegetative material. And there you see that the current system of plant reproductive material that has to be produced organic in order to be called to be called organic seed has been extended with two new categories. There will be in the new regulation organic heterogeneous material allowed. It's a difficult word, heterogeneous material. And there is uh, the possibility to use organic varieties. And I think that these two new categories give a lot of new opportunities for breeders and farmers together to work on plants that really work well. Um, in organic farming systems. When I shift from plants to animals, uh, in animal production systems, there are some changes in percentages. Uh, you will have to use feed from your farm or from the region to feed to your animals, and there is a minimum percentage. This is increased, this will be increased a little bit. For um, cattle, including uh, goat and sheep, the percentage will increase from 60 to 70%. For poultry and pigs, it has been 20, it will be increased to 30%. There is still a derogation for non-organic protein feed to be used in organic farming for pigs and poultry, and this will be further um, decreased, not the percentage, but the categories. For um, pigs, you can only use it for pigs up to 35 kilogram, for poultry only for young poultry. And there is envision that it will be um, completely phased out in a number of years. Very important for the poultry farmers is that the criteria for the veranda has have been clarified. It is now clearer if your veranda can be used as inside or outside area. And for the poultry farmers, this is really important because then they know how to calculate the number of animals they can keep inside their stables. When I shift from uh, uh, agriculture to processing, 
for processing, there are a number of changes that are looking small, but that can have a large impact. It is clear now that when you are using natural flavors in organic, you can only use um, a flavor where the biggest part of it really comes from organic. If you use an organic, if you use a, a natural lemon flavor, you can only use uh, the flavor where 95% of the flavoring comes from organic. Furthermore, there will be a ban on ion exchange and absorption resins, which are purification methods, with the exception of baby food. And there will be more flexibility in the non-organic ingredients that you are allowed to use. Uh, there is a very limited list on a European level, and it will be updated more often based on the shortages um, in the market. And so that is a, a short overview. Um, there are quite a lot of details, as Mr. Vales said, that still have to be regulated. So the impact of the regulation, we can only say after a few years or after a year. But um, with this short overview, I go back to, to you, Emanuele. Thank you, Marian, for your short overview. And welcome back, Nicola. Now we will have some minutes to have questions from the audience. I think there are already many questions from the audience and our colleagues in the backstage are working to select the most uh, uh, interesting ones and relevant ones. And I think they will appear soon uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, ah, we have already the first one. So uh, this is for both of you, let's say. So the new organic regulation is supposed to uh, be applied from 1st January 2021. But I think the work will be not over uh, at that date. So what are the main remaining issues to be discussed in the months and years after, for, uh, after 2021? So please, Nicola, first. Yes. Maybe, of course, in the I would say in the, the six first month, there will inevitably be some some questions, some adaptation. And of course, my unit will be ready to try to, to clarify. I, I don't think we need strong interpretation letters, but but for sure, there will be uh, clarification to, to be given for the six months for, for operators, control body and and Competent authority in member states will play a role as well as IFAM to, to be sure that that's, we have a smooth implementation of the new regulation. Uh, but you, you mentioned, Emanuele, what, what will be done also after not directly related to this uh, implementation. We have some interesting topic ahead of us. Uh, you, you mentioned, Marianne, the, the question of, of the marketed bait. You, you know that we will have a, a report in 2025 on maybe more broad on, on greenhouses because there are many questions on the eating system on greenhouses. We have a very, very important report on uh, uh, substance, presence of substance, um, we need to go for further harmonization. We know that we could not achieve the full harmonization we would like to have uh, on, on this issue of, of presence. So uh, we, we went for reinforcing the precautionary measures, the investigation. So we have already a step there, but still some harmonization should be done. But also some topics appears like for example, the, the, the question of in innovative buildings. Uh, we, we, we discuss on, 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 on peaks, on, on that you have a full straw system that probably 20 years ago you had really the indoor was a, a building, outdoor was something, and now it's a bit of a mix of things. So there was a need and there's a commitment from the commission in 2021 already to reflect on this new innovative form for buildings. And that would be lead to a very interesting question. So we have, I think, many topics that following these years, I mean, I would say five, six years really devoted on, on, on the regulation. We had we will not change, of course, the basic act next year, but we'll have things to prepare the evolution of the organic sector in the next year as well for these interesting topics. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, Marian, you have anything to add? Well, actually, a lot of things that Nicola said I completely support. Um, and actually, it, it, it builds up to 
um, is the regulation fit for the future? I mean, you can start it from a regulatory point, the open points that are not finished from the current discussions, but actually we have to take this point on the horizon um, where we want organic to grow. And then we have to look at the questions in that aspect. Um, one thing I would like to add on the discussion in the presence of substances, I think it is very important. Yes, it's a very important dossier. And um, it is also extremely important that we look at the discussion in the context of what does the presence of a substance mean? Because um, it will be too narrow only to discuss about uh, is it in or is it out? And does it, what does it, does that determine the organic quality? The organic quality is so much more than only the, the, the uh, presence or non-presence of a substance. And I think it's important to frame the whole discussion in that light. And that's what I wanted to thank add. You. Thank you very much, Marian. Uh, we, we will wait for next question. In the meantime, I, I would say that also the standard of insects can be an interesting topic to deal with. Uh, after 2021. So we have uh, another question. Uh, the implementation of the new organic regulation is not possible, according to someone in the audience, until the end of the year. Will the EU Commission postpone? Let's say this question is not a surprise and we were waiting for this. And please, Nicola. No, we, you know that IFOAM in particular has sent uh, a request for postponement, but we received the same request from member states and the parliament. But unfortunately today, the, the, the only thing I can tell you is that uh, the commission is, is still assessing this issue. So that's the only thing I can say at my level. Okay, we all look forward for uh, some information from the commission, hopefully in the next uh, days. It will be a nice uh, present for our summer, let's say. Uh, let's see if there are other questions from the audience. Uh, okay, this I would um, give more to Marian. Uh, Marian, what is the most positive change or changes that you see in this new organic regulation? Yes, thank you, Emanuele. Um, when you are now a farmer in, in Finland, I can think you're, you, you're probably not so very positive, but uh, I think that there are many elements in the new regulation that are positive. Um, if you look at the, the scope has been broadened, I think that's positive because consumers expect uh, new, that all the products in the supermarket shelf that are uh, with the organic word on it are really produced in the same way. And I think this broadening of the scope is positive. I also see a deepening of a set of regulations. It, it, it fits more to the principles, I would say, not in every aspect, because the principle of, um, of health is still not very present. The, um, but still, I think the, the deepening of the regulations, the use of, for instance, the, the uh, organic heterogeneous material, I see as something very positive. Um, and the harmonization, although it, it, is, it is a positive thing, the harmonization is, is good because a lot of organic products are traded all over Europe and with the whole world, actually. But the, the harmonization, I think, um, gives clarity to consumers, to processors, to producers. At the same time, it's a threat because agriculture is a very diverse system. It's, it's based on local conditions and um, especially organic. When you look through the regulation, it's said everywhere. Organic farming has to be based on local cl climate, local conditions, and their harmonization can also be a threat. Um, but I'm an optimist, so in general, I think it's positive. Thank you, Marian. I think we have just the time for our last question. If there is uh, another question from the audience. Yes, there is a question about group certification. Why is there a strong limitation on the size of farmers group and not, uh, and there is not a risk based approach? So this is more for Nicola. Yeah, uh, th this is, of course, uh, a question that has been widely discussed in in with the member states and you know that we are setting up new rules for the eu because the 
group of operators was not possible in the EU till now. It was only in the third country. And uh, there is a, a, a very strong, uh, I would say, common approach to member states that the size should be limited because for the moment you have in third country uh, a huge groups that mean up, up to more than 80,000 members for only one single certificate. And uh, we need to ensure a, a same level of assurance for the risk between individual uh, cert certi individual operators that are certified with one single certificate and a group of operators. So we are trying to find a balance where in one hand we are providing some flexibility, you reduce the cost for certification for small farmers, we are trying to, 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 to provide again uh, 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 less administrative burden, but still you need to keep the trust of the European consumer in the product. And we have all the audits on the field showing that this very large group presented some huge weaknesses because it's very difficult to set up an internal control system efficient with a flow of information and also with the control body to certify 80,000 people. So we are trying to find a balance between, uh, uh, again, flexibility and some security. But again, we are just talking on the group of operator for the purpose of certification. That means that you could have a large cooperative continue to do, and it's just for the certification that you are, you, do, you, you need to have small local groups, which we, we are still discussing on the, on the maximum size uh, of the groups, but there is clearly a will in the EU to set up a, a limit, which is a good balance again between flexibility and assurance on the control. Thank you, Nicola. Yes, it's very difficult to find a balance from what will be applied in the EU and in some third countries where the conditions are very different. But uh, I think we will go deep on this also later in the, in the following panel. So unfortunately, time is over for this session. I want to thank a lot Marian and Nicolas. And I want to thank twice uh, uh, Marian because I have to say goodbye to you. And Thanks again for joining the Congress and uh, uh, Nicola, please stay with us instead. Uh, next part of the session instead is focused on control certification and import. And uh, therefore, please let's welcome all together the next speaker, uh, Georg Eckert and Michel Renault. Hello, Georg and Michelle, and welcome back uh, to Nicola. Uh, let's briefly introduce Georg and Michelle. Uh, Georg is the president of EOCC, the European Organic Certifier Council, but is also the head of the Agriculture Department of the German control body Abicert, not only German, also <laughs> acting in other uh, countries. Uh, Georg, just to check the connection, from which city are you talking to us and what's the weather like there? Hello, Emanuele. I'm talking from Esslingen near Stuttgart. The weather is fine. I'm just coming back from holiday. We have a blue sky outside, but for the afternoon, a thunderstorm is announced. We will see. Probably it's coming from Brussels. Uh, okay, good. Let's go to the next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, the, the second speaker is Michel Renault and is a uh, new, uh, freshly re-elected board member in IFAM Organics Europe, but is also vice president of the control body, international control body, ECOCERT. Uh, so, Michelle, also with you too, just to check, I, I know that before February you were always around the world, but probably now uh, you are at home. So, where are you talking from and uh, uh, what's the weather where you are? I'm still not at home. It's my first time I travel since February. So I'm in the south of Germany, uh, in Constance, which is very beautiful, so close to uh, Georg. And we have also a nice weather uh, surrounding by a lake. So it's a perfect uh, conditions to uh, attend a, a congress of iPhone. Okay, very good and very lucky. <laughs> Uh, okay, everything seems good with the connection then. Let's start, let's start with the statements. Uh, we will start with Georg. Uh, Georg will present us the main expected changes and challenges for the organic control system in the EU. 
Uh, Michel and Nicola, we will be back in five minutes, and Georg, the stage is yours immediately after the animation. Thank you, Emanuele. Are we ready for the organic regulation? A short statement from CB's point of view. And please bear in mind that the delegated and the implemented acts on controls are still under construction. So I want to highlight four main topics. At first, the new approach of the on-site inspection. Under the current legislation, every operator gets inspections at least once a year on-site. In the new regulation, this will be also the main rule, but there is an exemption for the low-risk operators. Annual inspections will be continued, but in 24 months, there will be only one physical inspection on site. So every other year, the annual inspection will take place as a documentary check. How to do this efficiently is to develop, and it's quite a big challenge for the CBs. The second point, the management of the presence of unauthorized substances, as Marian mentioned. The new reg regulations wording is presence of the unauthorized substances. It's mainly discussed in the light of the pesticide residues or traces of pesticide, but there are also lots of other substances not authorized as fertilizers or disinfectants, feed and food additives and processing aids. And presence is not linked to any defined level or threshold. So in a scientific sense, presence means one molecule of an unauthorized substances. This is not applicable in our environment. A challenge for the operators and also for control bodies is to find a path between ignoring analytic results on the one hand and developing the right precautionary measures and their assessment on the other hand. Striking a balance between bureaucratic overkill and neglecting analysis results. Remembering the aim of the regulation is not to block organic products by suspicion caused by the smallest traces of pesticide, but of course to prevent fraud. Under a worldwide increasing use of pesticides and developing lab technology, more and more analysis will be positive, as we know, for example, from the organic soybeans from Northern America. A third, the group of operators. Certifying group of operators that is currently possible in third countries only will be possible also within the European Union, as it will be up to the groups of operators to set up an efficient, efficient internal control system. Control bodies will have to assess their internal control systems. This is a new exercise for the control, control bodies active until now only inside in the EU. At fourth, the approach on control rules in third countries is a little bit unexpected for the control bodies. It will not be the copy paste of control rules inside EU as we expected under the compliance system. And we had to learn compliance will only apply to the production rules. Michelle will tell you in detail later. Secondary legislation is still in progress and we do not all the requirements for the time being. UCC, gathering at now 61 members, remains supportive, providing its input to all the drafts of implementing and delegated acts. We wish more time would have been allocated to discuss the control rules as well as more clarity in the different versions of the drafts disseminated. We would like to remind that the final aim of the new regulation was to simplify the rules. We all have to keep in mind. Thanks a lot for your attention and back to Emanuele. Thank you, Georg, for this uh, uh, short uh, overview of what will change in the control system in the EU. Uh, let's go now to the part related more to the international trade, international certification and imports of organic produce into the EU. Uh, please, Michelle, we are looking forward to the main changes expected for EU importers, but also for 
certifiers operating outside the EU and in particular for organic producers all over the world. So Michel, stage is yours. Thanks, Emanuele, for this challenge in five minutes. Um, first, uh, I think um, many uh, as a basic rules and requirements are already uh, fixed in the organic regulation, but also in the official control regulations. Um, one thing we will say goodbye to equivalency, and um, I will say partly goodbye because uh, I think the trade agreement will still, uh, which will uh, come up, uh, will be based on equivalency, but many countries will not be concerned. So it means that we will have... Um, uh, many countries with, uh, uh, recognized certification body and this will be, uh, on, uh, on compliance. Um, I think which is good. The regulation has foreseen also some transition periods that uh, we are not, uh, under pressure, uh, to be able to, uh, to come to one regime to the other one. What does it mean compliance for the operators? It means that no, they will have to apply the, uh, regulation for the production, processing rules and all the rules and they will uh, apply one to one even if some adaptation are foreseen in uh, in some in some cases but they will not be uh, certified anymore according to the uh, so equivalency standards so 64 or 65 standards already existing it will be uh, only one the official control um, does not apply uh, in uh, in the third country so that's a reason uh, the regulation organic regulation has foreseen to have a uh, and the rules, rules. And, uh, in the secondary act and it will be uh, done and it's under discussions. Um, before to come into the control measures, I think it's very important to say that um, on the third countries we have, uh, we understand many uh, realities and we have to see that some are have system or the agricultural system very close to uh, the EU, uh, others are much more far. So we must consider also the third countries uh, with their diversity. Um, we see in the draft that we are already at disposal that uh, there's a will for more control in third countries. And I think if we share um, the will to have a reliable control system in order to, to improve it uh, and to improve the current one, we should um, avoid discrepancies, discriminations with first con uh, third countries. Compliance is compliance, so uh, it means that if we are compliant, we have to uh, have the same rules and the same rules in terms of control, in terms of content, uh, frequencies, so similar to the one we have in the EU. I take one example for the, um, uh, the forcing more sampling in the third I do not see this, it's the right direction to give I think sampling is a tool. It's quite helpful for uh, uh, the certification body, but it's not the only instrument and tool to, uh, to this confidence in import of uh, 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 of goods coming from third countries. So we must be based on, um, I would say, on um, a risk approach, and uh, they have also in the measure, in the way we do the control, also improvement that we can do, and uh, uh, it, it can be the way. The last point I wanted to, to speak, it was already mentioned by uh, 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 Nicola, and I think it was very interesting to hear uh, uh, the direction which is gave. I think it's uh, um, group certifications. And really, we appreciate that, no, it will be uh, in regulation, not only in guideline. It will apply it in EU and uh, in third countries. And uh, it's a good thing to have clear rules uh, for group certifications. Uh, we agree also, and I think we share with the Commission, that there is need improvement uh, 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 comparing to the current situations. But we must have very pragmatic approach. It was discussed about the size, and I think uh, if the size is an issue, uh, it must not be linked to entity or legal entity and, and so on. Otherwise, we will multiply legal entities only to satisfy the requirement of the regulations. I think to have cluster with a limited numbers of uh, 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 producer to certify it, uh, is a good direction um, because I think it's also uh, helpful for the certification body to be able to decertify it uh, without having any uh, financial or interest uh, uh, pressures. So we will support it, but not to link to uh, a legal entity and we could have cluster and, and so on. Uh, it's the same for the rate of uh, reinspection, but we have also in discussion and I think I'm sure we will find a, a, a compromise uh, uh, in this to have a reliable uh, 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 system for this. Um, what I want to say is that from the side of iFarm, we will 
continue to be very active, but also very constructive to, to have this uh, simplified and reliable uh, regulation, because I think it's very important to have something sim simplified, but also reliable, and we will um, support any continuous uh, improvements. So thank you for your attention, and uh, back to Emanuele. Thank you, Michel, also for this uh, short uh, overview, and welcome back to Nicola and Georg. So now we start again with questions from the audience. I'm sure there are many, and in the backstage are already working uh, to show us the, the best. Uh, so in here we have the first. Uh, so what, what would be the impact on the operators in relation to the changes in control and certification? So this I would ask to Georg first. So the impact of the control change of the control system on the operator side. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Emanuele. On the one hand, I think the new regulation uh, strengthens uh, the responsibility of the operators in dealing with the presence of these unauthorized substances, I said uh, in the short statement. On the other hand, we see a more risk oriented uh, approach in the uh, total control procedure, which puts the examination of precautionary measures in the foreground. The challenge, um, I think, will be to evaluate these precautionary measures correctly and appropriately and to define this sphere of the influence of the company or of the operator on pollution without making them responsible for ex actions and residues like spray drift from their neighbors. Thank you very much, Georg. Uh, Nicola, do you have some short addition on this? Yeah, just also to say it, it's not only what the regulation has changes. I would say that also the practices are changes. I mean, we, we have to also to cope with this challenge that now uh, organic is getting in the mainstream. There's big business. You have uh, important operators which have often a more legalistic approach. And this has to be taken into account, I would say, in a way to protect the CBs. I mean, because CBs are often in the middle of the competent authority of the commission and the operators who, who doesn't want to see their, their product decertified. So uh, we, we try at least, as Georg said, yes, to, to have uh, uh, some more role in the precautionary measure on the risk assessment, but try without to be too bureaucratic and too complicated, but to clarify the step, what what steps should be taken, what information should be exchanged. We have also an important aspect on, on the catalog of measure, what we, we think we try to, we would like to improve that. At least you have the same list of non-compliance. You could qualify them in the same way if, if they are mi minor or critical and also to have clear measure for, for the CBs to be undertaken when you are in this non-compliant situation. So uh, I don't think it's a big revolution. It's rather to, to, to clarify, to make it uh, a bit more clear. And, and again, that we are not at the end of the road. We still have some further harmonization later on. And last thing I would like to say is that we, we have to live with this new regulation for, for, for one year and two. and, and the basic act is difficult to change, but the secondary legislation could be adopted, adapted uh, to take into account the, the small adjustment that, that we probably will have to make to, to make the life of operators and CBs and competent authority easier to try to simplify that later on. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Nicola. Michel, you want to add the last word on this? You have some elements to add? Yes, uh, I think it would speak more for the third countries. Uh, I think on the production uh, side, there will not be so much uh, uh, impact on the operators of uh, existing equivalent standard are slightly different. So I do not see any uh, big impact. I think one impact that we will see because we have also uh, the, um, the um, Implementation Act and Delegate Act are not completely finalized. If we have an increase of uh, frequencies and, and so on, it will be have an impact on some operators. For sure, I think from now on, we can be sure that there will be an impact on Grover Group. Uh, but I think it's, uh, um, we, we can see on both ways. I think it's, uh, it will be 
probably more uh, external control uh, and uh, we will have smaller uh, group for the purpose of certifications. But I think we must see this also in a positive way where it is also to uh, to secure and also uh, to lower the risk also for the operators dealing with this. Uh, it's uh, better to lose 1,000 farmers than uh, 20,000. So I think we must see uh, that we can uh, find there uh, it could be positive if it's uh, well managed as I mentioned before. Thank you, Michel. And let's wait to see if there is another uh, question from the audience. Yes. The change concerning the use of natural flavorings have an important impact on products. Are you not afraid that this new regulation will decrease the offer? So this is very specific. I, I will just ask shortly uh, to answer to, to Nicola because it's not really uh, on control. So just a short answer for yeah. Nicola. Uh, I could easily reply that it's in the basic act. So uh, like it or not, uh, it has been decided and it's not a mistake. It's it's on purpose that there was really a willingness to, to, to strengthen, as Marianne said at the beginning, to strengthen the category of flavoring. And it's true that it's a huge change in the processing industry. They have to reformulate a lot of products. You have to find for uh, new sources that will be uh, um, linked with the regulation. Uh, I th again, on, on our side, I mean, it's in the basic act. Uh, it should be uh, an adaptation uh, and uh, it should be feasible. That means uh, at the first Again, they, they, they have to look for, for new sources. They have to, and it's a way also to develop uh, the trust of the consumer because I think on organic, that's what the parliament say when they decide it. It's very difficult to, to say that you could have a, a vanilla flower in, in, in organic or coming from uh, beet pulp uh, and biotechnology. So that was the, 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 the decision. So we have to, 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 there's no, no, nothing to do in the secondary legislation. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, let's wait for the next question on the control system. Ah, what are the changes in retail controls? So this I would ask to uh, Michel first and Georg afterward. No, I think I'd let Georg, it's more uh, AU okay. issue for, for present time. Okay, in retail controls, I think, um, we don't know exactly what the changes may be because we have um, the limitation in the reg in the basic regulation is due to the um, due to uh, limits of um, amount of, of selling products and so on and we don't know to how to deal with that at now we know that a lot of um, retailers won't undergo the certification and control system of CBs so there there is an a challenge uh, for the um, authorities, inspection authorities, um, to organize it with a food safety um, um, food safety uh, um, authorities. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think there is nothing to add from the other speakers. We have only a few, few uh, minutes left and we have other questions from the audience. Okay, this this time uh, uh, I will start from uh, Michel again. <laughs> what is the most positive change in relation to control and certification? I will ask to the three of you. Yeah, okay. What is most? I, I think it's. Uh, I, I will link to for me to the um, third countries uh, and let uh, Georg for the EU uh, side. Um, I think one thing is, yeah, the compliance is uh, probably will also um, give a possibility to, uh, also give a possibility to uh, to say goodbye to the for the CB to have their own standards to manage this, which is quite uh, lowering, and to try to have uh, an harmonized harmonized uh, uh, approach. Uh, because also, but the key will be uh, the adaptation, which are necessary in some countries. But I think there's a, a place for this. So I think this is quite a, a positive, and um, we will see uh, because the control measures it's only drafting now, so it's difficult to uh, to see uh, or to say um, which it will be 
better or uh, worse. I think our message was to say, try to be as close as possible as the one existing in the EU and with some adaptations uh, for some supply chain what is necessary. Thank you. So time is almost over. So please one sentence from Georg and after Nicolas. Oh, one sentence is difficult. Finding the positive aspect is not so easy as we have still um, the 28 years experience with the uh, previous control procedure. But um, I'm the opinion that uh, positive aspects are the better regulated exemptions, the increased responsibility of the operators in uh, case of the presence of these unauthorized substances and the more uh, risk-based control system it's certainly worthy of mention. Also, as the broadening of the scope, as Marian mentioned in the former session. It's uh, within the, the... Okay, enough? Yes, thank you, thank you. Now, uh, time is over. Nicole, I don't know if you want to add one more element very shortly. No, no. Okay, good. So we, we, we have to go to the next panel already. Uh, that is more about import and uh, group certification. So we move from the EU to outside the EU. And the first question would be from my side to Nicola. Uh, Nicola, do you see any impact on the flow of products coming from outside the EU to the EU? Indeed, it's not the intention. Huh? That's uh, in, in no way uh, the regulation will be to make uh, uh, to make a discrepancy or unfair competition, and and that's just a way to have the most efficient rules that preserve the trust uh, of the product in the EU, and it's for the interest of the uh, third country as well. I mean, if you destroy the market in the EU, then then it's uh, it's very catastrophic. So. Uh, ju just to say, of course, we, we, we have to set up specific rules on control of imported product because the compliance, as I to say, is only applying to the production. Why? Because, of course, in the control in the EU and the supervision, the CBs are under the supervision of the member states. And the member states has a lot of tools also to fight against non-compliance and fraud in the EU because they have judicial uh, authority against the operator. In the third country, the only sanction we have is to delist the, 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 the control bodies. That's the only thing that the, the, um, the commission can do. We cannot act against an operator in third country. So that means the situation are not exactly the same. So that's why uh, we have to adopt and to adapt some specific rules for control, which are uh, uh, very inspired of the existing regulation. And we try, as uh, uh, Michel said, we try to be as close as possible of what uh, is uh, will be implemented in the EU. But again, uh, when you have to decide on the derogation for catastrophic circumstances, in the EU, it will be the member states because there is a, a official state of catastrophic circumstances. What, what do you do in Kenya? I mean, so, so there's a specific rule for, 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 uh, the CBs there. And, and the same, so we have to adapt specific rules, which again will be a balance that we ensure a, a right level of assurance for the imported product while uh, not blocking the product. That's, that's the, the, the way we want to do. And that's why, again, we are very open to the consultation. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, Michel, you have, an element to add, or we got to the next question? I think go to the next. I okay, we yes, we have many the... questions from the audience. So yeah, that's let's see what, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Okay, the first, uh, always to you, uh, Michel, what will be the impact for farmers in third countries? Yeah, I already mentioned this. I, I think we third countries is so a diverse thing. So I think for some of them will be not so many uh, 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 impact. It will be uh, business as usual, uh, uh, especially for big farm or the uh, farm or the, the one close to the EU uh, uh, agricultural practices. I think the big impact will be on. Um, as I say, on uh, group certifications um, in the way that uh, no the regulation will be also clear. There will be a clear requirement what an internal control system should be, how it should be organized, which is on one side a very good thing because it was only uh, really uh, uh, in a guideline and uh, uh, 
slightly reference on, on this. So I think it's, um, and we will have, uh, probably more, more controls, uh, because of, uh, uh, the external rate will apply to the, uh, a limited group, uh, limited numbers of uh, farmers on, on a group. So I think it will, the most impacted will be probably, uh, a, a group certification. Okay. So it depends from the final rules on group certification. Uh, Georg, you want to add something or we go to the next? No, oh, let's go to the next. Okay, let's see the next question then. Ah, this is for you, Georg. So what would be the impact for control bodies? I mean, control bodies acting outside the EU. I will ask to you, you and Michel afterward. Oh, it's it's difficult for me to talk for the CBs outside the EU, but I think um, they they have to to find their place in this uh, kind of new system, and it, it's it's a challenge for them all. Starting with these discussions about group certifications and the limitation of members of groups, and um, it's it's a change. But but I think Michelle uh, could uh, add the details. Okay, so please, Michel. Yes, I, I think there's um, already mentioned by uh, um, um, Nicola. Uh, th there are some. Uh, we are not in the same in the EU, so it means that we have we have a competent authority, but which is. Uh, I will say virtually or, or uh, the commissions, but uh, we will sometime uh, to have to to act for the catastrophic uh, circumstances, for example. So we will have more responsibility in some way, and we must see also that uh, not too much uh, on the slow, um, shoulder of uh, of the CBs, and to to find a way where we can also have, have an harmonized approach, because big responsibility is given to the CBs, as several CBs are acting in one uh, country or in the same country, we must find a way or the mechanisms where we can try to harmonize and to have a, a way with the Commission. I can understand that they want to delegate this, and uh, I think we uh, are able to take this over, but we must find mechanisms where we can have a, a place to exchange or to harmonize uh, the position we will take. But I think it, it's, uh, it would be important. Otherwise, I think it's, uh, we go a little bit over our responsibility as CB verifying. We have to take position sometimes, especially in uh, uh, catastrophic circumstances, and uh, we must find a way on, on this. But um, this is, I think, where I see the most uh, uh, impact, uh, which will be uh, quite new, and uh, we will see how to manage it. Thank you, Michel. Uh, Nicola, you want to add something on the impact on control bodies outside the EU? Yeah, it's not a revolution again. Huh? You, you, you have to see that we do not change radically the, the way that the, the CB will work. The, the, the compliance system, in a way, I think would be simple for even for even for the producers themselves and the CBs because up to now, the equivalent is really up to the CB to 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 submit their own uh, standards, which was uh, very burdensome for for the Commission and the CB. So at least for the production and the standards, you, you will have a, a more harmonized approach and more, I, I would say, legal security also for the producers in third country. You know that we have a kind of flexibility for specific authorization for uh, uh, some plant protection products that are not approved in the in the EU just because. It's, we don't have the, the specific disease, so we, we try to find some flexibilities. And uh, again, I, I think we need to find some, some rules to protect the CBs again, because I, I insist, I mean, the operators, even in third country, are bigger and bigger. We are talking about multinational companies, huh? and it's very difficult for CBs then to, to decide that uh, it's not in line, it's not compliance, and it's extremely difficult when you have a very large uh, producer group. And so we need, again, to find a, a balance to, to is the way how the CB will perform in a good manner in third country. Again, it's a matter of balance. It's that's why you are in a very close contact with EOCC for our member states to try to find the concrete rules that will allow CBs to continue to perform because uh, CBs are, are the, 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 the key, uh, the, the cornerstone of the system. Huh? Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Nicola. I think we have the last question from the audience that will appear in a few seconds. 
Uh, will the new country equivalence approach, bilateral only, change the pattern of which type of countries can hope to obtain the EU equivalence in the future? So, Nicola, this is mainly for you. No, no I think it doesn't change. It, it, it changed the, for, the format. Again, again uh, it was a clear willingness from the Council and the Parliament to say it's not to the Commission to just uh, agree on what we call administrative arrangement, this equivalent agreement. It should be based on the international agreement. That means that the, the Parliament and the Council wants to have a say, to say with whom we will negotiate this new equivalence agreement and what will be the extent of the equivalence. That do we agree on that, that this practice is equivalent or not? So it, it's rather the format to, to what we have in mind is that we will go in, in September uh, rapidly to, to, to ask for this negotiating directive to, to renegotiate, even if it's, the, the, it's in 2025, we would like to start immediately, and especially to start with, with the existing arrangement, the 11 existing one where unilaterally we decide to stop. I mean, it, it's, it's a priority for us, and especially with our main market, that means Japan, Korea, Canada, US, I think it's a, it's a priority for us to start the negotiation as soon as possible with this type of country. Thank you, Nicola. Unfortunately, the time is over again also for this panel. I want to thank you. I think now the audience has a flavor or flavoring, just to be in line with what we said before, of what the new organic regulation will be. Uh, I want really to thank you. It was a very interesting exchange. I hope also for the audience. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's time to say goodbye to you. I hope to see you physically soon, all of you, when it will be possible. And thank you again. And I want to uh, welcome back Joyce. Hello again, Emanuele. Very interesting session. Thanks a lot for doing such a great job. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Relieved, right? A little? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. It was an interesting uh, uh, session, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and I wonder, what is your key takeaway then from that regulation session? So let's say that we have heard that there won't be many changes in the, in the new organic regulation compared to the current, but some of them can be quite significant and have also an impact on operators and certifiers. So I can perceive more changes in the control system more than in the production rules, also because there will be transitional period for the producer to adapt to the new requirements. Nevertheless, I think it is crucial now to start with a big communication strategy or campaign towards the operators in the EU and outside the EU, but also towards the competent authorities in the EU and outside the EU, towards the accreditation bodies uh, and towards the certifiers, of course. So we need to start communicating about these, uh, um, let's say, these new requirements, because even if they are not many, again, they can be uh, significant and they will take time uh, for, in particular for the control system, it will take time to get prepared uh, to the changes. So um, coming back to our uh, initial question of the session, are we ready yet for the organic regulation? Uh, I think that the next six months are really crucial. Uh, IFOM with uh, IFOM Organics Europe with its members is working hard and always under pressure and also during the summer, as, as we have heard uh, just before, to prepare political and technical input to be provided to the policymakers. We are aware that also the Commission and the member states are working hard. These are very difficult. Uh, job. And the final goal of everyone involved in the process should be a final set of regulations that, of course, is in line with the principles and objective of organic production, but that it is at the same time also implementable uh, on the field from the producer and also for the, uh, for the control actors, let's say. So therefore, to answer from my side to your question, time is running. Few months are left and there is still a lot to do. At the moment, on 1st of July 2020, today, we can say that it will be quite uh, 
challenge to start on 1st January 2021. Indeed, as we already asked to uh, mm. all the policymakers, the Parliament, the Council and the Commission, one additional year would be very useful to reach all the aims that I mentioned before. Yeah, thank you for that opinion. Uh, thumbs, are, uh, thumbs are pressed, fingers are crossed for that, postponing. Um, so let's see what our audience thinks about that. Um, Dear audience, we really want to know your opinion on the session. So let's do a final and last interaction with them, right, Emanuele? Yes. Resulting in a word cloud, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we need you to type in one word when I ask the next question, and then you have 10 seconds to answer. Please do so typing in just one word. The question is, what is your key takeaway of the day? 10 seconds starting now. Emanuele, would you comment, please, on the first results? Can you read that? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I can read uh, with difficulty, but I can see the first word. That is a word that I also use, and it's challenge. So <laughs> this is really a challenge for the people uh, uh, writing the regulations. It will be uh, even a bigger challenge for the people that have to implement the regulation in uh, very few weeks from the publication. So again, I'm happy to see that everyone sees it uh, challenging and we will have a close analysis of the other work to understand uh, the reasoning behind. But challenge, I, I, I would have used the same word. Yeah, cool. So and we are more than 500 people, uh, persons in this uh, um, session. So I think, yeah, they agree on it's a challenge. So a lot of work in front of you, all of you guys. And yeah, that's the end of our second session of first day of EUC. Thanks again, Emanuele, um, for your uh, nice presentation of our expert speakers. And thanks everybody for listening, interacting with us, um, attending first day of European Organic Congress uh, 2020 Organic in Action. Um, tomorrow uh, we will have some nice cap session and some more about organic action plans. So be sure you join in. If you have any questions concerning the program, please go to our website, organic-congress-i4meu.org. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, Emanuele, some last goodbyes from us and... Thank you very much to you, yeah. uh, Joyce, for hosting uh, me and the speakers. And it was again a very interesting session and thanks to the audience for uh, listening to us. Yeah, please take care. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Thank you for joining the European Organic Congress 2020 today. Organized by iFoam Organics Europe and BULV and with great support by our sponsors. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central European time. Thank you and goodbye.